The Austrian election takes place this Sunday, the 29th of September. In this video, I'm going to briefly explain the differences between the five main parties. I'm then going to talk about the history of Austria since the Second World War. Most of this section is going to be about the origin and the histories of the FPO. In particular, I'm going to talk about Jörg Haider and I'm going to play a, a video that the FPO released about him to, um, last year on the 10th anniversary of his death. I'm then going to talk about the Ibiza affair, which is the big scandal which brought down the last Austrian government. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can expect to happen on Sunday. Austrian politics are quite straightforward. We have a Green Party led by Werner Kogler. They're polling at around 12% at the moment. The SPO, the Social Democratic Party of Austria. Traditionally, the SPO and the OVP have dominated Austrian politics, usually governing together in a grand coalition. NEOS are a relatively new party. That stands, NEOS stands for New Austria. For a long time, the FPO were the Liberal Party in, in Austria, but during the 1990s, when Jörg Haider was turning the party further to the right, a lot of Liberals left that party, and that's where the origins of NEOS lie. The OVP, the Austrian People's Party, they're Christian Democrats. The difference between Christian Democrats and the centre-right in the UK and the US are Christian Democrats are generally more open to the idea of government spending to, uh, in relation to social causes. So I suppose you could compare them to one nation Tories in the UK. Finally, we have the FPO. The main differences between the FPO and the OVP are the FPO are, take a harder line on immigration, although also the OVP have taken a harder line on this since Sebastian Kurz became party leader. And they also are Eurosceptic, which the OVP is not. And they generally talk more about stuff like Austrian identity, Austrian culture, Austrian light culture, um, the need to maintain this light culture, this dominant Austrian culture. These are the results of the, the elections that have been held in Austria since the war. The numbers on the left, that's the, the year of the election. The other numbers are the percentage of the vote that the parties got. When the box is coloured in, that means that those parties formed a coalition after that election. So in 1945, the SPO and the OVP formed a coalition together. Red is the, traditionally the colour of the SPO. Black is traditionally the colour of the OVP. I've also included the BZO in this. The BZO was a splinter party. Well, it still exists. The BZO is a splinter party of the FPO, which broke away in the 1990s. Looking at these numbers, the, the first thing that strikes you is the extraordinary number of grand coalitions that we've had in Austria. This is a particular peculiar quality of Austrian politics. Starting off in 1945, the OVP had enough seats to form a government on their own, but they decided to form like a government of national unity with the SPO. And after that, when both parties didn't have enough seats to form a, a government by themselves, they preferred to work with each other. The only other really option during those years was the FPO. They didn't want to work with them, not because the FPO were pariahs, they weren't pariahs during those years. They, the, S, the SPO and the OVP worked with the FPO at state level, and in 1957 the OVP ran a, a joint presidential candidate with the FPO. They just preferred to continue working with each other. The OVP also saw the FPO as rivals and competitors, so they preferred to try and win over their voters rather than cooperate with them. When we get to the 1970s, the SPO starts to win majorities by themselves. This is quite unusual in Austrian politics. Those three election wins in 71, 75 and 79, that's, is, that's the only time since 1945 that a party has been able to win a majority by itself. The Chancellor during those years was Bruno Kreisky, who is probably the most important figure in post-war Austrian history. Let's talk about the origins and the history of the FPO. So they started off in 1949 as the VDU, the Federation of Independence. And later in 1955-56, they merged with a smaller party and they became the FPO. This is an early election poster from 1949. Here's another poster from the, the VDU. It shows the, the red and the black bulls representing the SPO and the OVP tearing Austria apart. The VDU attracted four main types of voters. The first type was former members of the Nazi party. They were attracted to the VDU because the VDU wanted an end to the policy of denazification. Denazification was 
all about keeping former members of the Nazi party out of positions of power in post-war Austria and Germany. In practice, what this meant was hundreds of thousands of people faced all types of discrimination in relation to what type of jobs they could get in the government, in the media, in the arts, also just in the mainstream economy. So when we say that they were opposed to denazification, there's nothing sinister about that. It wasn't about bringing back the Third Reich. It was simply about ending these, this discrimination against former Nazi party members. So, and it was about really just allowing these people to get on with their lives. I think it's important to clarify what the FPO's relationship was with Nazism. A lot of former Nazis joined the FPO, that's true, and they had the highest percentage of former Nazis amongst their party members. But lots of former Nazis joined the SPO and the OVP as well. In fact, the combined number that joined those two parties was more than joined the FPO. The FPO was not a, an extremist party, it was not a pro-Nazi party. You'll often read as well that the FPO was founded by former SS officers. I mean, technically this is true. The first leader of the FPO in 1956 was a man called Anton Reinthaler. He'd been an SS officer, but he wasn't a, an extremist. He was a moderate. And anyway, this is all besides the point because the real roots of the FPO go back to the VDU. And the VDU had been founded by two journalists who had been persecuted by the Nazis. They wanted a party that pushed for denazification to end, not because that would benefit them personally, but because they thought denazification was harming Austria, that it was divisive and that it was holding back Austria's recovery. The next group that the VDU attracted was liberals. Now, these were people who weren't crazy about the OVP because they didn't like the extent to which the OVP was prepared to intervene in the economy. And they also didn't like the, the influence of the church on the OVP. And they obviously had issues with the SPO as well, being free market liberals. The third group were people who were opposed to the church, who didn't like a strong church influence on society. This overlaps with the liberals, and of course the OVP had a, a, a strong Catholic influence in their party. The final group that the VDU attracted was German nationalists, and that they had traditionally used the blue cornflower as their symbol. And at times in the past, the FPO has also used this, this flower. It's probably why the party adopted blue as their colour as well. Okay, so what are German nationalists when we talk about Austria? Well, in the 1800s and the early 1900s, the big issue in Austria was the question of German unification and was this going to include Austria or not? So you had two camps in Austria, really. You had one camp who identified with a separate Austrian identity. They, they identified with Austria's empire, its separate history, with the Habsburg monarchy. These people tended to be the establishment, the church, the military, the upper class, state officials, and so on. And these are the type of people who would go on to form the OVP. German nationalists in Austria, they didn't really buy into this separate Austrian identity as much. They identified more as German and they were sympathetic to the idea of there being a single German state, including both Germany and Austria. Before the war, these type of people gravitated towards the SPO. That was the party that was more associated with German nationalism, but not after the war. So after the war, these people tended to gravitate towards the FPO. Overall, the, F the FPO in its early years was a national liberal party. So it was a liberal party in the centre of the political spectrum with a bit of a nationalist element to its ideology. When we get to 1983, the SPO and the FPO formed a coalition for the first time. The FPO leader at this time was a guy called Norbert Steger. Now, he'd been moving the party even closer to the centre. And this was creating a little bit of conflict within the party because not everyone liked this. And during that parliamentary term, 1983 to 86, there was a change of leadership in the FPO. This is when Jörg Haider enters the scene and he would then move the party further to the right. This is a video that the FPO released last year on the anniversary of Jörg Haider's death. It's a pretty good summary of, of his career and the major events in his career. So I'm going to play this and I'm going to talk over it and I'm going to describe what is being depicted. Now, 
So here we have the early Haider. He was elected to the National Parliament in 1979 at the age of 29. He became the leader of the FPO in the state of Corinthia in 1983. Here's the first state election in Corinthia under his leadership. The FPO got their best result in 40 years. Here, Haider saying that the, the results of this election show that we have policies that resonate with the voters in this state. Now, in 1986, this is when Haider became the leader of the National Party. In 1989, these are the second state elections in Corinthia under Haider's leadership. This time, the FPO were able to form a coalition with the OVP and Haider became Landis Hauptmann of Corinthia. Landis Hauptmann is like the Prime Minister of Corinthia. It's the equivalent of Minister President in Germany. And it was the first time that an FPO member had been able to become Landis Hauptmann of any state. But Haider's term was cut short in 1991 by a big controversy when he was accused of praising the Nazi-era employment policy. I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. This is Haider's speech when he was forced to stand down after the OVP withdrew their support. Haider saying that, um, I go today, um, I leave today without anger and with a certain amount of pride and I leave today with, with uh, I leave today unbroken, unbroken because I know there are many people who are on my side but who are unable to help me today although they wanted to. So Haider spent the intervening years building up the party and in 1999 this was Haider's Annus Mirabilis. It starts off with the state elections in Corinthia when Haider got back in for a second term as, as Landis Hauptmann. So this was Haider's big comeback. Here he is being interviewed, he's being asked about the national elections later in the year and he said the people in this state have just put their faith in me and it would be arrogant of me to start um, thinking about anything else. So here we have the, the national elections which took place later in the year and you can see throughout his career Haider was a real election machine and this election they had an historic result, they finished second ahead of the OVP nationally. Now after this election here Haider is saying um, I don't know whether we're going to go into government or going to stay in opposition but I want to thank thank everyone for, for their help, all the workers for their dedication during the campaign. So after the election, they did in fact go into government. They reached an agreement with the OVP. Here they are signing the, the coalition agreement. That's Wolfgang Schussel with the, the bow tie, the leader of the OVP. There the two of them are again in Haider's port. So this was very much the, the high point of his career. But because of the controversy surrounding the whole thing and the controversy surrounding him, Haider stood down as leader and he didn't form part of the government. That's Susanna Rees Passer who, who um, replaced him as leader. Now this was a period of, of turmoil in the the FPO, a lot of internal conflict, a lot of division, and they got hammered at the next national elections. They lost a huge amount of their support. It was much better in Corinthia, where Haider was still the leader, and they didn't lose any of their, their support at the next election in Corinthia in 2000 and in 2004 that election was. So Haider stayed on then for a second term as Landis Hauptmann. But all of this division in the party, it all came to a head in 2005. By this stage, there were two factions in the party, one led by Haider and one led by a young Heinz Christian Stracke. And here Haider left the FPO and he formed that new party, the BZO, which was more moderate than the FPO at that time. So in 2006, they got 4% of the vote. And then in 2008, they got 11%. So this at this point, it looked like Haider was back. It looked like he was going to be a big player on the, the national scene again. But two weeks after the election, Haider died in a car accident. He crashed his car late at night. Here's a memorial. It says, um, forever in our hearts. Thank you, Jorg. So that was more or less the career of Jörg Haider, this extraordinary, charismatic and controversial individual who had a huge impact on Austrian politics and turned the FPO into what it is today. 
Okay, so let's fill in a few of the gaps that weren't um, covered in depth in that video. So that the comment that Haider made about the Nazi era employment policy, that took place in 1991. There was a debate in the Corinthia State Parliament and Haider was talking about the high level of unemployment and how the national government in Vienna's employment policy wasn't working. And he was suggesting that unemployment benefits for foreigners be restricted and that they be uh, they be made to, to work for their unemployment benefits. And he was being heckled by this member of the SPO and the SPO member said, yeah, they tried that in the Third Reich. And Haider responded, well, no, they didn't have that in the Third Reich because the Third Reich had a proper employment policy, something which this current government in Vienna can't even manage. So this created an enormous amount of controversy, as you can imagine. Haider said he wasn't praising the Nazi era policy. What he was doing was criticizing the SPO policy when it comes to employment. But nonetheless, that led to the collapse of his government in Corinthia. We could talk all day about all the controversial things that Haider has said. I'll just mention one more because I think it's probably the most important. It's this comment he made about the Waffen SS. Now he made this comment at an event called the Ulrichsberg meeting. Now Ulrichsberg, this is a it's on the side of a mountain in Corinthia, and there's a couple of war memorials there in memory of Austrian soldiers in the two world wars. This event isn't in itself an extremist event and members of various different parties have taken part in the past, but it's, it's always had this controversial vibe about it. Now, Haider has attended many of these meetings and he said some controversial stuff, most notably in 1995. Now, he was addressing at this time a mixed crowd of um, people from different nationalities, some of whom had actually fought against Germany in the war, and he addressed them. And this was the comment that caused the controversy. He said, when he was addressing this crowd, he said, there are still people, still upstanding people, people who have character, people who have remained true to their convictions despite the headwinds that they face. This is a basis, this is a foundation, my friends, that we can also pass on to our youth. And a people who do not honour their forefathers is doomed to extinction. Now, this was reported in the press that Haider was addressing members of the Waffen SS when he said this. And Haider has denied this. He says he wasn't specifically addressing the Waffen SS veterans when he said this. Although he did say in, it, in an interview with Austrian state broadcaster ORF a couple of months later, he'd said that the Waffen SS, they did deserve to be honored and recognized because they had been part of the armed forces during the war. Haider also said at another Ulrichsberg meeting in, two, in the year 2000 that it's not right that the history of our parents and ancestors is reduced to an album of crimes. Look, everyone is free to make up their own minds about this. There's no video of the event. Personally, I find it hard to believe that Haider literally turned to a group of Waffen-SS veterans and said, look guys, it's, it's great that you're sticking to your Nazi-era convictions. I think something's been misconstrued along the way. I think what Haider was talking about was the need for Austria to move beyond this guilt and shame, this toxic guilt about the war. I think in Germany, um, Bjorn Hucke has, has said very similar things. Even Alexander Gauland, the leader of the AFD, has said that Germans have the right to be proud of the achievements of their soldiers in the two world wars. So I think that's what, what Haider is talking about, the need to move beyond this, this toxic shame and guilt in Austria and Germany about the war. I've looked into a lot of these controversial comments that Haider has made over the years, and there's, a, there's a, a common thread running through all of them, and that is that although what he says is controversial and risque, it's never quite as controversial and risque as the media would have you believe. There's always some context to it, there's always to it, more to it than meets the eye. So Haider was leader of the FPO between 1983 and 1999, and you can see the extraordinary growth and support that the party had during those years. And this shows you the type of impact that he had on Austrian politics. Also, look at the numbers under NEOS 6641 and 94, 95, 99. They're the liberals that left the FPO during this year. They formed a party called the LIF, the Liberal Forum, and the Liberal Forum later merged with NEOS to form a new party. NEOS's full name is actually the New Austria and Liberal Forum. 
You can also see the split that occurred in 2005 when Haider left and formed the BZO. The BZO took over the FPO's place in the coalition. So you had the OVP BZO coalition. Then they got 4% in 06, 11% in 08. And then after Haider's death, the party sort of um, faded away. So after Haider left the FPO, this was the start of the Heinz Christian Straka era, or the HC Straka as he's known, his era. You can see that he had a big impact on the party as well. and He grew the support of the party and he eventually led them into coalition in 2017 with the OVP and Sebastian Kurtz. Now the, the FPO for a long time had been polling in the low 30s and it, they were number one in the polls and it looked for a while, remember this was all against the backdrop of the, the migrant crisis which began in 2015 and it looked for a long time that the FPO were going to win the next election and that Straka was going to be the, the next chancellor. But what happened was this guy came along, the OVP, he became leader of the OVP and he adopted a really hard line on immigration, an unusually hard line for ostensibly what is a mainstream centre-right party like the OVP. Um, Kurtz has been called Prince Arnhardt because of this. Now, this harsh policy on migrants and immigration, this really resonated with voters and it took a lot of the wind out of the FPO's sails. The FPO still ended up with a decent percent, but they ended up finishing seconds and Kurtz would become the Chancellor, not Straka. This is the video that brought down that government, that brought down the OVP FPO government. So what are we looking at here? Okay, so this was recorded in a villa in Ibiza in the summer of 2017. It wasn't released for two years. So that's Heinz Christian Straka sitting down on the settee in the, the grey t-shirt and the glasses. The guy standing up, that's... Uh, Johan Gudenos, who's a senior member of the FPO and a, a close friend of Straka. The woman to Straka's right, that's Gudenos' wife. Now there's two other people in the room. There's a woman to Straka's left who is mostly obscured. Now she is pretending to be the niece of a Russian oligarch who is interested in buying a major Austrian newspaper called the Kronen Zeitung. Now this paper is by far the most popular paper in Austria and it has a lot of power and influence over voters. Now what she's saying is, if I buy this newspaper, what are you going to give me in return? And Straka says, if you buy it and if, you, if, if I buy the paper and if I push the FPO rather, she says, if I start to push the FPO, start to promote the FPO. And Straka says, if you do that, um, set up a construction company and I'll send a load of government contracts your way. So this was probably the most controversial part of the video. The woman pretending to be the uh, niece of the Russian oligarch. She also pushes Straka on this and she says, okay, you'll give me contracts, but will you also give me them at a markup? That is like, will you pay over, over the going rate so that we make a nice profit? And she pushed him on that and Straka said yes. So that was the most controversial part of the video, but there is other stuff that Schrecker said as well, which got him into trouble. He talked about creating a media empire like Viktor Orban has in Hungary. Now, this means that in Hungary, most of the public and private media is, is pro-government. So this got Straka into some controversy when he said that. And the final really big controversial thing that he said was he said that the FPO have a, a secret um, non-profit uh, foundation which they're using to circumvent the party donation rules. So uh, donors were donating to this non-profit foundation and this was going under the radar of the authorities. So as you can imagine this was all very controversial and it led to the collapse of the, the OVP FPO coalition and Straka and Gudenos both stood down from their positions. Now we still don't know who was behind this video, who set it up, who arranged it, who funded the whole thing. A lawyer, an Iranian born lawyer in Vienna called Ramin Mirfakrai has said that he was involved in it, but it seems very unlikely that he was the only person involved in this. This was a, a really professionally set up sting operation involving multiple cameras, multiple microphones, and this the setup for this had been going on for months in Vienna. They, they had been in contact with Gudenos in Vienna. Vienna. So we still don't know who was behind this and why and, and why it was only released two years after it was originally filmed because of course it was originally filmed in the summer of 2017 before the Austrian election had taken place.
So that has led us to where we are now. Here are the uh, opinion poll numbers. You can see the 2017, the election results. Not a lot changed in 2018. The FPO lost a little bit of support. They continued to lose a little bit in 2019. Then they did take a bit of a hit after this Abita video was released. They were polling around 17, 18% in the, the weeks after that was released, but they've recovered a bit since then. So looking at these polling numbers, um, we can see that no party is going to win a majority and the next government is going to be a coalition and it's going to be led by the OVP because no other combination is possible because the other parties won't work with the FPO. So it's going to be an OVP-led coalition, but we don't know who they're going to deal with. And all of the possible permutations here are problematic. If they go back in with the, o with the FPO, certainly those two parties are quite close ideologically, but um, Kurtz has said some pretty strong things about the FPO that he's going to have to maybe um, row some of them back if he's going to go back in with the FPO. When he when he ended the coalition, he said that there had been a lot of incidents during the the coalition that had that he'd found hard to swallow, but that he'd remain silent about. He'd also said that some of the FPO ministers weren't fit to govern. Kurtz has a particular problem with this guy, Herbert Kickel, who was the FPO's interior minister, and he's been involved in some controversial incidents, most notably in 2018 when he ordered a raid on the security services, the Austrian Domestic Intelligence Agency in Vienna. Now, Kickel said this was because he was acting on a request by a state prosecutor, and this was because the intelligence agency was breaching data security regulations in the way that they were handling their data. His critics have said that this is actually politically motivated, and what he was trying to do is put pressure and force people out of the security services who are um, hostile to the, the FPO and try and bring in people who are more friendly to the party. It's difficult to see how Kurtz is going to agree to work with Kickel again. Now, this is a problem because the FPO have stuck by Kickel. They haven't hung him out to dry and they've they've defended him and he's featured in their election campaign. He's also very popular with the FPO voters. He took quite a hard line on immigration. Um, Martin Sellner, for example, who's the leader of Aus the Austrian Generation Ident Identity, the uh, Identitera Bewegung, he said that um, Kickel was the best interior minister in Austria's history, and he's not—he's not the only person who said that. So this is if there is going to be an FPO OVP coalition, the Kickel situation is going to have to be resolved. The coalition that Kurtz and the OVP would really like is with Neos. That they would be the party that he would find it most easy to work with. The problem there is they probably won't have enough for a majority, although they may, they may. We'll see what happens when the results come out. The other options for the OVP aren't brilliant either. The SPO, there's a lot of bad blood between Kurtz and the SPO. And he won't enjoy working with them. Also, Kurtz's right wing immigration policy is going to be a problem for them. And Kurtz can't really drop that because that's one of the main reasons why he became chancellor in the first place. The only other option then, the Greens, again, the issue of immigration is going to be a, going to be a problem there. And what are the Greens going to make um, Kurtz do in relation to energy policy and taxation and so on? You could have a three-way um, coalition between the OVP, NAOS and Greens. That's probably the most likely it looks at the moment if they won't go in with the FPO again. But as you can see, all of these combinations are problematic and it's going to be difficult to form a coalition government after after this election. So that's more or less the background to the Austrian election. I'll be tweeting about the election on Sunday. I'll tweet exit polls, turnout, early results and what the um, the politicians are saying. So if you're interested in that, have a look at my, my Twitter page. Otherwise, um, in the meantime, thanks for watching and until next time.